Good morning. It's good to see everybody out on this rainy day. You know, uh, we're starting a brand new series, and it's called Villains. And I, I think it kind of throws people to think, you know, you'd actually dedicate a series to talking about the bad people of the Bible. Uh, but years ago, I read this book. I think it was Liz Higgins. I think that was the author. But it was called Lessons in Good Living from the Bad Girls of the Bible. And I thought, well, number one, I just love that title. But, but, but two, her point was... You know, these characters, they take up space in God's word for a reason. Some of their examples are warning to us. Others of us, we're reading their stories. And what we also learn is how God treats the worst of sinners. How does God interact with them? Where do we see grace? Where do we see his love breaking out? These lessons are really important because God chose to include them. And many, like the character we're looking at this morning, get major space in the word of God. So we want to explore their example. We want to find out how God treats those people because it has direct implication for how he treats us. So if you will, just bow your heads with me today. We're going to talk about Pharaoh and mercy and judgment. But as we get started, let's pray. Father, I believe that you're here already in a powerful way. And I would ask that you would just continue in your presence among us. Continue to speak to hearts and to lives. Continue to minister to us where we are with exactly what we're needing. I pray, God, that you'll use the sum total of my preparation 
and, and, and how I communicate today. But more importantly, Lord, I pray that your spirit would just have free course in every heart and life. In Jesus' name, amen. So some of you are fairly young Christians, and after you became a Christ follower, maybe you got your first Bible and you started reading. So you said, let's just begin at the beginning. And you started reading at the book of Genesis and started going through. Well, not very long into your reading, you discover that way back in ancient history, at one time, God destroyed the entire earth with a, a flood. And then not long after that, you find out he annihilates the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You get to the book of Exodus, and you find out about these 10 plagues that fall on Egypt. You also discovered if you lived back then, you probably didn't want to be a Canaanite or an Amalekite because it doesn't appear that God was very fond of these people. So the more you read, the harder it became for you to understand just how this God you're reading about in the Old Testament is the same one that Jesus referred to as a loving Heavenly Father in the New Testament. So this, this issue has been around for a long time. The idea that in the Old Testament, God was some kind of God of anger, wrath, and judgment. And then by the time you get to the New Testament, he's metamorphosized and he's become a kinder, gentler God. Now, personally, I don't think that's an accurate reading or understanding of the Bible. But I've met a lot of people who think that. In the early church, there was a guy by the name of Marcion. And Marcion thought he figured out the answer. Marcion believed and he taught that the two images of God were so incongruent that they must be two completely separate gods. He taught that the God of the Old Testament was an evil being, the creator of matter in this sinful world. He then said that Jesus came to reveal the true God, the God of grace and love, who had been sidelined by the lesser God of the Old Testament. Well, you should know that the church rejected Marcion as a heretic and his teaching as heresy. In modern times, liberal theologians take a different tack. They take a more sophisticated way of explaining the differences. They say in the Old Testament, the differences between the old and new are not two different deities. But in the Old Testament, these early scriptures, you have God as he's understood by primitive people. And the New Testament reflects man's understanding, his evolution in understanding. Now, personally, I got to tell you, I think there's a better way to explain the differences in the Testament than inventing two gods chucking it up to evolution, or throwing away the Old Testament. And I think you're going to see that today as we go through this. I do agree that there's a lot more emphasis on the wrath of God in the Old Testament. But I'll tell you this, you don't get rid of the problem of the wrath and judgment of God simply because you throw away the Old Testament. You get to Matthew 25, and Jesus speaks extensively about judgment. You get to the book of Revelation, and the book, things in the book of Revelation pale in comparison, I mean, these, these things are, are huge. And the Old Testament pales in comparison to that book in terms of its description of judgment. So the truth of the matter is this. There is no characteristic of God talked about in the Old Testament that's not reiterated in the New. I'll give you a couple of examples. Just the word mercy occurs 261 times in the Bible. Do you know that three quarters of those references are in the Old Testament? How about the word love? The word love occurs 322 times in the Bible. Half of the references are in the Old Testament, which means half are in the New. Bottom line, God has not changed. He's the same God he's always been. In fact, both Testaments agree on this. The last book in the Old Testament, God says, I, the Lord, do not change. And here we have in the book of James in the New Testament, the Father does not change like shifting shadows. In other words, God's the same God he has always been. So if God hasn't changed... Why do people see such a sharp distinction between who he is in the Old Testament and who he is in the New? It's my contention that most people believe this simply because we read the Bible too superficially and we don't pay attention to important details. And I hope to bring that out today as we go through this message. So I want to begin by talking about Pharaoh and the fact that he is most definitely a villain. So the first thing we discover, discover about uh, Pharaoh, which Pharaoh is not a proper name. I hope you know that. Pharaoh is a title. It's like king. So there were many pharaohs in the Old Testament. Here's one. And he enslaves an entire race of people. The book of Exodus opens about 300 years after Genesis closes. So when Genesis closes, we find that the, the children of Israel have gone to Egypt because of famine. There's about 70 of them in their families that are in Egypt. By the time Exodus opens up, there's nearly 2 million Jewish people in, 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 um, in uh, Egypt. And so there's, there's, there's a big difference there. But these Israelites have multiplied so much. There's a new pharaoh in town. 
He doesn't know the history of how these foreigners came to live in Egypt. He doesn't know Joseph, who's the one that helped to bring them there. And he's growing increasingly intimidated by this large group of people that are not Egyptians living among them. So what we discover rather quickly is he's going to enslave these people and use them to pull this massive resource, this labor pool, to build the splendors of Egypt. And this is what we're told early on in Exodus. This is Exodus chapter 1. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. So get this, Pharaoh, Egypt is an empire. And they have become so powerful that now what they've done is they have, they have accumulated so much stuff from conquering other nations that they have to build those cities of Pithom and Ramesses not as places for people to live, but as cities to store all their excess wealth. And so this is why they use the slaves, why they use the Israelites to do that. The second thing we know about Pharaoh is this. He practiced systematic genocide. So in verses 9 and 10 of Exodus 1, the Bible says, look, this is Pharaoh speaking. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal with them shrewdly or deal shrewdly with them, and they will become even more num- or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies. They'll fight against us and leave the country. So Pharaoh is so intimidated by this large group of foreigners in his country, not only will he dominate them, but he will attempt to exterminate them. And the first way he does it is through forced labor, through slavery. Now, how does forced labor, how does slavery control a population? Well, one, you work people to death. And two, you work women to the point of miscarriage. And so this is his plan. I'm going to work these people. I'm going to break these people. I'm going to control their numbers by doing that. The problem is it backfires. The children of Israel continue to prosper in terms of growing in numbers. So Pharaoh says, okay, this is not working, making them slaves. So I need to take it up a level. They'll remain slaves. And now we're going to try infanticide. Now infanticide is asking the Hebrew midwives to commit a partial birth abortion. Which means as the baby's being born, if they determine it's a male, the the Hebrew midwives are to kill the baby right then and there. That's his order. But what we understand in the story is the Hebrew midwives, they fear God more than they fear Pharaoh. So they refuse to cooperate. They're not going to be a part of this. These women that are helping the other women to give birth, they say, no, we're not going to kill those babies. And so again, the numbers continue to grow. So once again, Pharaoh has to kind of take it up to a new level. And this new program, here's what happens. Nahum Sarnam says he mobilizes all of his people, the Egyptians, the entire apparatus of the state to annihilate the people of Israel. Here's how it says it in the Bible. The Pharaoh commanded all of his people, all sons that are born, you must throw into the river, but all daughters you must let live. So get what he just said here. He's saying you as Egyptians, the Hebrews are not cooperating, their midwives are not cooperating. When you find a young Hebrew male, a baby. It's your job to take that baby from the mother's arm and drown it in the river. I mean, this is full-blown Holocaust. This is full-blown, I'm going to take your children and we're going to kill your children and it doesn't matter. So he's mobilized the entire people to watch for the boys being born among the Hebrews. Now, here's the other thing about this story. Never one place in this entire episode does it say that Pharaoh rescinded this order. So as best we can tell, this order remained in effect even through the plagues, the judgment that comes against Egypt. Now, scholars have tried to estimate how many baby boys over the span of time between this edict when it's announced and then the judgments when they fall, that it could be well in excess of 2 million baby boys that were killed by drowning by the Egyptian people. What I'm saying is this, if there's ever been a person in history who deserved the wrath of God, it was the Pharaoh. He was cruel. He was vindictive. He's hard-hearted. He commits unspeakably evil atrocities, and never once do we find him issuing one word of regret or remorse. So let me tell you something from the heart. The story of life on this earth, the heartache, the misery, the woe that exists in this world, it doesn't make sense if there's not a villain. I mean, how how else do you explain the Holocaust, the killing fields, the genocide of Rwanda, the martyrdom of Christians in the 20th and 21st centuries at record levels. There's evil in this world. 
And there's an evil one behind it all. And a God that does not judge evil is not a good God. So what we find in Scripture is a loving God who is committed to destroying that which is destroying us because that's what a loving God does. A loving God watches out for his people. A loving God takes note of those people like the Hitlers of the world, the Idi Amins, those people who cause untold suffering on this planet. So the, first th the, the third thing I want to mention to you about Pharaoh is that he's hard-hearted. Now, as we go through this story today, what you're going to discover is Pharaoh, every time there's a judgment leveled against him, he repents. He admits, I'm, I was wrong, I was mistaken, forgive me. He comes clean every single time. But the problem is, it's never sincere. He always goes back. He always reverts to his old ways. And some of us do what Pharaoh did. When things get tough, we go back to church. When things are better, we sleep in. When life is falling apart, we cry out to the Lord. When life is good, we forget about God. So repeatedly throughout this section we'll be looking at today, Pharaoh repents. But he doesn't really repent. What he's doing is called pain management. You know, I'm hurting right now, I'm going to say the right words, and then maybe this will relent, and then maybe they'll let up. It's like what John Ortberg said. If we see that our repentance is just a way to get quick relief, but have no intention of changing our behavior or attitudes, we are not truly repentant. So get this, when it comes to the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh, I want you to know in the scriptures we find 10 separate times that Pharaoh hardens his heart. Now, those of you who've read this story might have been confused by this other phrase I want to mention to you, and that is we're also told 10 times that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and those are the references. Now, when we read that, we think, wait a minute, God is punishing Pharaoh for something God did to Pharaoh? That doesn't make sense, and it doesn't. But what you have to understand is this is a Jewish idiomatic expression. I'll let James McKnight explain it, and then I'll explain what he said, okay? James McKnight says this, active verbs were used by the Hebrews as the Jews to express not the doing, but the permission of the thing which the agent is said to do. Now, I know that's really wordy, but let me explain what he's saying. God gave us a free will. We can all make our own choices, and he will not override them. God will let you do what you want. But sometimes the Bible, and this is not the only place in the Old Testament or the New that it does this, but sometimes in the Bible, using very figurative language, it describes an event like God himself is performing the action. But really what it's saying is, is Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and the Lord just let him have his own way, which is certainly what he does with every single one of us. You make your choices, and God says, have it your way. That's what's going on here. When it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's not God doing that. Pharaoh hardens his own heart, and God says, okay, well, have it your way. Be stubborn, right? Like your, kids, your, like your parents used to say to your kids, right? Be stubborn. If that's the way you want it, tell me how that works out for you. That's what we do. So God is doing the same thing here. Now, what I want to do is shift gears for a minute and talk to you about the plagues and the liberation of our God image. So in Exodus 5, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. That's what God has said. And Pharaoh's response was not to say, Moses, thank you so much for bringing this gross injustice to my attention. I'll expedite the paperwork right away and we'll get those people out of here. No, his response was, okay, I'm going to take the straw away from the slaves and they can make bricks without straw. So Moses' career as a labor union negotiator was not off to a good start. Pharaoh just gets more hard-hearted, more oppressive than ever. The next thing we find is in Exodus chapter 7, and it's the dueling serpent. Remember this scene? Charlton Heston, I mean Moses, he throws down the rod, right? When he throws down the rod, it becomes this cobra snake. Well, Pharaoh's unimpressed because his two magicians right there can do the same thing, so they throw down their rod, and they become snakes too. Of course, the next thing that happens, and by the way, you understand the dynamic here. Pharaoh, his, his whole dynasty, the cobra, is the symbol of the Pharaoh's power. Egyptians worship cobra deities. They're supposed to protect them. And what ends up happening is Moses' staff, his serpent, his cobra, swallows the other two. It's the first power lunch in history. I mean, this is what's going on. And then in chapter 7 through 13, we have the plagues. Now, these are not just neat special effects. These are intended, designed by God to demonstrate his power over the Egyptian gods. So, so get this, Egypt, Egypt is polytheistic. 
They worship more than 80 different gods. Here's what uh, Will Durant, he's a very famous historian, said, for beneath and above everything in Egypt was religion. We see its influence in literature, in government, in art, in everything except morality. We cannot understand the Egyptian or man until we study his gods. So every one of these plagues was a direct insult to a different god of Egypt. Now keep in mind, the first nine plagues, there's ten of them, the first nine are very similar to the kind of plagues that have struck Egypt from the beginning of time. What God is doing, he's intensifying every single one, and he's calling out when it will happen and when it will end. So early on the story, Pharaoh asked this question. He asked the question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Everything about this story is intended to answer that one question. Who is the Lord? Who is this God of the slaves? Who is this one who calls himself the great I am? And it is the central question of life too. Who is God? What is he like? That's the ultimate question in life. Since Egypt had so many gods of its own, when Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, my God demands that you release the slaves, Pharaoh says, well, who's your God? I mean, he's just a minor deity. We've got 80 of them. you got one. I'm not the least bit worried about what you have to say. So the other factor that you have to keep in mind is not only is God showing the powerlessness of these gods, but it's to convince two groups of people that he is God. Number one, the Egyptians. The Egyptians trust in all of these gods, and they have to be put in their place. But guess who else believes in these gods? The Hebrews, the Israelites. They believe in those gods too. They've been living 400 years in this foreign land. 400 years they've disconnected from their faith. Remember when Moses, he goes to the burning bush and he says, they're going to ask me, who are you? Why are they going to ask, who are you? Because they don't know God anymore. What will I tell them your name is? And God says, I am. You tell them I am has sent you, right? They have disconnected completely from their faith. Instead, they believe in these foreign gods. Joshua says the same thing. Look at this. Put aside the gods of your ancestors your, or your ancestors worship beyond the river and in Egypt and worship the Lord. So what God is going to do, he's going to take on the power of Egypt, the grip that Pharaoh has on the minds and hearts of the people, both the Egyptians and the Israelites. In the end, we know that God will destroy Egypt's military might, might and he's going to do that at the Red Sea. But before he do, does that, he has to destroy something even more powerful the grip of religion on everyone's heart. He's got to change this thinking that somehow these gods in Egypt are really gods. So God himself tells us explicitly what the plagues are about. Look at this. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So the purpose of the 10 plagues is to reveal God. There's a formula. It says it again and again, that you might know that I'm the Lord. And you'll see all the references. Pretty much 11 times in five chapters, God keeps saying, I'm doing this so that you will know that I'm the Lord. So I want to give you a quick overview of the 10 plagues. I'll draw attention to a few of them. Like the very first one is water changed to blood. The Nile River is the heartbeat of Egypt, and it has been for all time. All trade, all commerce, all crops depend on the Nile. Now, when it says that the Niles turn to blood, it can be either understood as literal blood, which, of course, would be no problem for God, or metaphorically as blood red. The Bible really doesn't specify as far as that concern. The plague was an affront to all the greatest gods of Egypt. The great Kanum was the guardian of the Nile. Happy was the spirit of the Nile. One of the greatest gods of all in Egypt was Osiris. And they believed, Egyptians believed, that the Nile was his bloodstream. So many of Egypt's gods were either associated directly or indirectly with this river in its productivity. When it turns red and their gods can't change that, it shows them to be powerless. Now, the second plague is frogs. The presence of frogs is really understandable, right? I mean, once the Nile turns red, the frogs leave the river and they come in abundance out on the land. Now, here's the thing you have to understand. One is the frog they believed was a theophany of the goddess Hecht. Hecht was the god and creator of the world and the goddess of birth. So if you look on some ancient um, Egyptian ruins, you will often see what looks like a person with a frog's face. That was Hecht. And they worshipped this frog. And they worshipped it so much that you were not allowed to kill or injure a frog or you could be put to death. 
So these frogs come out in abundance, and the Bible says they even invade Pharaoh's bedroom. So he can't toss them out. He can't stomp on them. He's got to protect those frogs. It was very irritating. Now, what's really interesting is Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, set the date. Tell me the time you want the frogs to be gone. And Pharaoh says, tomorrow. Now, there's a very famous sermon on this passage called One More Night with the Frogs. And it's all about procrastination. And it's a funny, funny sermon, and I love it, but it totally misses the point. There's a reason why Moses tells Pharaoh to set the day when they're supposed to go. Because up to this time, Pharaoh's not believing this is the finger of God. At this point in time, he knows that from time to time, the river Nile turns red. This could easily be done by clay. It could be any number of tricks. And he just says, you know, I'm going to chalk that up to a natural disaster. And these frogs, of course, they're going to leave the river when it turns red. He's just, Moses and Aaron are capitalizing on a natural disaster to threaten me. So in order to help the Pharaoh understand the frogs and the river are not just coincidences or natural disaster, God tells, God tells Moses, tell Pharaoh, say the day when you want them to be gone, they'll be gone. And if that happens, then it's not just a natural disaster because you don't have any say in that. Does that make sense? Okay, the third plague is lice. The word lice is often translated sand flies or fleas. It comes from the word kanim, which means to dig under the skin. So it's some kind of insect that tends to burrow under the skin or injects us like a mosquito. It's, it, it would be a great embarrassment to Geb, who was the great god of the earth. The fourth plague is swarms. Uh, many translations say of flies, but the Hebrew doesn't say of flies. It just says swarm, so it could be any swarm of insect. The fifth plague is the livestock becomes diseased. So this is all the, the horses and especially uh, the cattle. And they're not only highly valued in Egypt, but many times they're worshipped. They're considered sacred. The sixth plague is boils. Uh, this is probably skin anthrax, which is a black abscess that develops into a pustule. It's interesting that one of the few gods that Egypt worshipped was a human being, Imhotep. Imhotep in history is one of the first people we know that was medicinal, that had a medical and a healing kind of ministry. And they ended up worshipping this guy. And this would have been an affront to him. The seventh plague is the one I want to camp out on for a minute. So the seventh plague is hail. Hail comes from the sky, which is the domain, the realm of Nut, who was the sky goddess. But I want you to listen to the warning that Moses gives to Pharaoh. Behold... Tomorrow, about this time, so a full 24 hours away, I will cause very heavy ra hail to rain down, such as has not been seen in Egypt since its founding until now. Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field. For the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field, and it is not brought home, and they shall die. So you hear what he's saying. Moses goes into Pharaoh and he says, you got 24 hours to prepare for this. If you don't want your animals injured and you want food to eat, go out in your fields, gather as much food as you can, bring your animals inside, bring your servants inside, and no one will be harmed. Now you wonder, did anybody listen to this warning? Well, guess what? They did. Look at this verse. This is verses 20 and 21. He who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and livestock in the field. So some of the Egyptians believed, and in particular, some of the Egyptians in Pharaoh's court believed. And they said, you know, everything else that God said was going to happen has happened. He's telling us you got 24 hours to get your food and get your animals and get your servants inside. Hail's coming tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to hang out. Netflix all day. You know, I mean, this, they're not going to go outside because they believe what God has said. So the other really interesting thing about this hailstorm is only the barley and flax fields were struck. Wheat and spelt were completely spared. This is another indicator of the mercy of God. Barley is largely the food for the animals, but wheat and spelt is food for humans. God wasn't trying to destroy the entire food supply of the Egyptians. What he's saying is, I'm doing this to prove a point. There's mercy in this. There's abundant food that's left. The judgment is not intended to destroy you. It's measured and it's merciful. The eighth plague is the locust. Now, locusts are a big problem in Africa. Sometimes locusts would come into a village and destroy every inch of crops within minutes. 
Back in 1926 and 1927, there was a small swarm of African migratory locusts that were spotted in an area of about 50 miles by 120 miles by the River Niger in Timbuktu. The next year, the swarms invaded Senegal and Sierra Leone. By 1930, all of West Africa had been affected and the locusts had traveled 2,000 miles. But get this, it took 14 years for it to end. It affected 5 million miles of Africa, an area nearly double the size of the United States. That's what locusts can do. This plague was so severe that Pharaoh summons Moses back and admits that he sinned. I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you and Aaron. Now, if you counted the times that Pharaoh has done this, this is the eighth time he's confessed to making a mistake. Now, listen to this. Every time Pharaoh repents, God relents. Every time Pharaoh says, I'm sorry, God stops the plague immediately. And every time God stops the plague, Pharaoh reverts back to what he was doing before. Is he sincere? No, he's not sincere at all. But God still honors the insincere repentance of this guy who's a really evil, bad dude, continues to give him mercy again and again. The ninth plague is darkness. Now, in Egyptian mythology, we're getting closer and closer to Pharaoh. In Egyptian uh, uh, mythology, Horus was the god of light. Ra was the sun god. It was believed that the pharaohs were the reincarnation of Ra, that they were actually the sun god. And because they were the sun god, they could create light. So when the darkness falls, and it falls for three days, this is to finally get next to Pharaoh. Everything else that's happened up to this point in time, Pharaoh has been relatively unscathed. It's his people that have suffered, but he's in his palace, he's in his mansion, he's got everything that he needs. The people are the ones that are, are really hurting. Of course, they participated in this genocide too. But now it's getting close to Pharaoh. Now what God is doing, he's stripping this idea that somehow Pharaoh is God. I'm going to create darkness and your incarnation of light is not going to be able to overcome it. The final plague is the death of the firstborn. Now, here's where you have to understand the significance of Pharaoh to his people. Look at this. Unlike other rulers in the ancient Near East, the Egyptian Pharaoh did not merely rule for the gods, but he was, in a literal sense, one of the gods. So Pharaoh's not bowing, not only because he believes all these other gods will protect Egypt, but because he believes himself to be a god. And I don't have to bow the knee before any other god. So this 10th plague is completely outside the, the series. It's not like the other nine at all. These are, this is not a natural event. It completely defies explanation. And the last plague is directed at Pharaoh himself because the Egyptians believe he's God. And when his son dies, the next God dies. And it proves once and for all, this is no God. But keep this in mind. God tells him what will happen. He tells him when it will happen. And he tells him what to do to avoid it from happening to him or anybody he loves. There's always a way out with every judgment of God. You know that, don't you? Every judgment that God ever speaks in Scripture, there's always a way of escape. And God tells Pharaoh right up front, you've seen everything else happen on my timetable. When my people have listened to my warnings, and, and, and even those outside, when they've listened to the warnings, it's happened just the way I said. And now... Pharaoh, his son, does not have to die if he listens to what God said. It's only his stubbornness that causes his own son to die. So then the third thing is this. Even God's judgment is tempered by mercy. So I want to kind of go back through and make some general observations about the things I've shared with you. If you look at these plagues, there's five unique characteristics to them all. Number one is intensification. So all these things, pretty much frogs, Nile River, red, insects, darkness, all of them have occurred before in Egypt. These are just intensified versions of everything that have happened before. Second is prediction. Moses, God's prophet, comes in and says, here's when it's going to start, here's where it's going to end. That's unique. Third thing is discrimination. There's some of these plagues that only hit the Egyptians and does not enter into Goshen where the Israelites are living. Now, plagues don't do that. Insects don't do that. Blight doesn't do that. This was happening in this case. Fourth thing is orderliness. There's an orderliness to the nature of the plagues. God begins very gently to try to lead the Egyptians away from Pharaoh. When Pharaoh asks Moses to stop the plague, God does it immediately. But whenever the plague is lifted, Pharaoh disobeys. So think of it like this. We have three sets of three and then the culminating one. The first three plagues, they cause discomfort. 
The next three plagues cause destruction. So there's an escalation. The third is devastation. And then finally, the last one produces death. But they all have a moral purpose. These are not freaks of nature. They're designed to teach a lesson. So this story, what I want to tell you right up front, the story we have in the Ten Commandments, God is showing us when I have to judge a people for their sin, this is how I do it. And every other judgment we find that specific divine judgment in Scripture fits this same pattern. So I want to share with you the characteristics of specific divine judgment. And this has huge implications for what we say about and to other people. Whenever God is going to judge a people, it always fits the same pattern. So I'm talking about the Genesis flood in chapter 6 of Genesis, Sodom, Gomorrah. Even the book of Revelation in the New Testament fits this bad pattern. This is where we see it best, and this is where we learn it most clearly. So here's the pattern. Specific divine judgment is always toward a specific group of people about a specific sin at a specific time. Specific divine judgment is always announced by God or his prophets before it ever happens, so you know who it's coming from. And third, there's always a way out. So it's a specific sin, it's announced in advance, and there's always a way out. When God is judging people, he lets them know what's happening and why. When God is punishing people for sin, he's not silent about it. And this is what makes me so angry when I hear people attributing natural disasters to God. You hear somebody that loses a parent in an accident and people say, you know, I think it was a judgment of God for how that person's living. A kid gets cancer. Well, you know, I think God's just punishing them. Look at all their life choices. When the tsunami and earthquake hit Japan, you know, this is just the judgment of God. When Katrina happened, People are saying, you know, this was a judgment of God, that hurricane hit. I mean, you think about the debauchery of New Orleans. God is judging that city. And I always want to ask, well, does God have bad aim? Because the French Quarter was spared, you know? I mean, the worst place in the city. I mean, how is that the judgment of God? What my big objection to is, it doesn't fit the pattern. What specific act of rebellion is God judging? What prophet was there ahead of time saying it would happen, how it would happen, when it would happen, and who was saying this is the way of escape to avoid being judged? And if those things aren't happening, it's not a biblical judgment of God coming from the heart of God. And when people say that, stay away from people like that. It doesn't fit the word of God. So when you get in trouble, and things take a bad turn in your life, and you start thinking, maybe God is judging me. Please understand, these passages are given to us in the Bible also for an assurance for our heart. You know why bad things happen? We live in a world where bad things can happen to anybody. And if bad things can happen to anybody, they can happen to you too. That's the truth. And so when you read judgment then, into those kind of things, what we do is we take somebody who is suffering, who absolutely needs the presence and assurance of God, and we make them feel like they're actually being victimized from God. What we're saying, when people make those statements, what they're telling you is how they view God. They're saying, I think God's maybe like an abusive parent. You don't know if he's going to hug you or slug you. If you don't know why it's coming, it doesn't have a disciplinary effect. If I don't know what it's about, and I just feel like I'm judged, then I'm just shooting in the dark, trying to figure out why has this come upon me? God is always clear every time in his word when he brings judgment on the people, here's the sin I want to correct. Here's how we're going to do it. If you confess and you repent now, it's not going to happen again and again. The next thing, you need to pay attention to time and intensity in this story. So if I ask you the question, how long did it take from Exodus 7 to Exodus 12 for these plagues to play out? What would you say? Some people might say days. Others might say weeks. Maybe some of you thought, you know, being generous, a couple of months. What if I told you they played out over nearly a year? Listen to this. In June, the Nile becomes stagnant and red with microscopic organisms. July, frogs abound after the inundation of the Nile. Hot summer and damp autumn months. Lice, flies, murrain, and boils. January, hail and rain. Now, by the way, this date really is fixed because of the crops that come to, to harvest at that time, we know that the hail came because of the crops that were destroyed that happened in January. 
February, appearance of locusts in early spring over the green crops. March, darkness from the great sandstorms. April, the death of the firstborn, that's dated by Passover celebration. So we know for sure the seventh plague, which is hail, and the last plague, the tenth plague, which is Passover, that's four months. There's no question about that. You can debate the other, the other times, but just the last four plagues occur over a four-month time of, of, of span. So many of us, we tend to think it just came and came and came and came, and it never relented, and that's really not what happened. So something else I want you to consider. Pharaoh had more extraordinary evidence than practically any person in history. This is God. Here's what I have to say. Here's what's coming. Here's how to avert it than any other person. So when, Pharaoh, when, when Moses says to Pharaoh, here's what will happen, here's when it will happen, here's what you do to avert this thing, Pharaoh does nothing, not even to save his own son. After everything he's seen, after everything he's experienced, even his staff knows he's wrong and tries to convince him otherwise. And he's not listening to anybody. God always gave Pharaoh a way out. In fact, 10 ways out. With every plague, there was a way to escape. But consider this. Pharaoh never gave a way of escape to the Hebrew babies. He never cut them any slack. He never said, if you would do this, I won't do that. He was merciless, and yet God was merciful. Aren't you glad that God is merciful? Aren't you glad that God doesn't repay us the way we have often treated other people? That God is not his disposition, his character is not determined by ours. His response is not determined by our meanness. His response is not determined by our hard-heartedness where we say no to him again and again and again. We say, I just want to do what I want to do. God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. And our callousness and Pharaoh just saying, yeah, I repent, even though he didn't mean it, did not change the heart of God. So the last question is, did God love the Egyptians? You should know that the book of Exodus doesn't just record the Israelites leaving Egypt, but even Egyptians left with them. Look at this. The Egyptians urged the Israelites to leave, and a mixed multitude also went up with them. Some of the Egyptians left with the Hebrews. We know that some of Pharaoh's own advisors were spared the judgment during the plague of hail. We also know that God gives specific instructions for the Passover meal to accommodate the alien, the person who's not a native Israelite, to say, yes, these people who see the hand of God, they can join up with us too, and this is how you include them in this festival. So God fully expected that there would be Egyptians who would come to faith as a result of what they witnessed and experienced. Later on, when God lays down the law for his people, listen to what he says. Do not despise an Egyptian because you resided as foreigners in their country. When somebody has done the kind of things that the Egyptians did to the Israelites, usually there's a kind of hate that develops in the heart that we just don't want to let go. These people are our enemies. Look at what they did to us. And God says there's no room. There's no room in the family of God for you to hate an enemy. We've got to love those people and remember that at one time we resided in their country as foreigners. But remember this, Ezekiel 18, 32, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Judgment is so foreign to God that the Bible often describes it as his alien work. That God's default is set on love. God's default is set on mercy. God's default is set on grace, not judgment. And so when he judges, you will always find in every recorded incident in Scripture, here's what's happening, here's why. Here's when it'll happen, and here's what you can do to avert it. Because God always wants to make a way of escape. I am so glad that I serve and I love a God who will always judge evil, who will always destroy the things that are destroying the people that he loves. But even as he works with the worst of sinners... There's nothing but mercy and grace, and here's the way of escape, and let me show you my love. And you do realize, don't you, that that's what the cross is all about. That God was saying, listen, I know you have a sin problem. I know you're broken. I know that sin deserves to be punished, and it was. It was punished in Jesus Christ. He was hung for my hang-ups. I don't fear the judgment of God, and if you're a child of God, you shouldn't either. All of that was taken care of in Jesus. 
One day I will stand before him in his righteousness because Jesus Christ has made me whole. He's taken my punishment. I don't worry about that. And so when bad things happen to my life, my default is not, God, what are you doing to me? My default is, God, I know you're going to be at work in my life no matter what happens. And I know that even if this doesn't turn out the way I want it to turn out, God, you will not cease to love me. You will never fail a single promise you've made to me. I know I'm safely and securely in your hands because I'm your treasure and the cross proved that to me. He does judge sin. My sin was judged in Jesus. I've been set free. I hope you are too. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you that we have this time together, that we can take a passage about a true villain, an evil person, a person that really tried to systematically wipe out an entire people group, to intermarry with them and wipe out their seed and wipe out their legacy. And he was not successful because, God, you are for the oppressed. You are always on the side of the broken. And, God, you intervene. And even at the same time as you intervene, you showed that you had great love for Pharaoh. He lived through all of this. He continued to be taught again and again and again. Again and again and again, you gave him a way out. Again and again, as he insincerely repented, you still met him with mercy and grace. And Lord, I'm just so grateful that I don't get what I deserve. I get grace. I get love and abundance. I get your heart and I get it all. I know, God, because of what Christ did on the cross, my sin has been punished fully. I don't worry about that anymore. And I pray if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, that they would reach out right now and just say, God, I want you in my life. This, this forgiveness, this sense of cleansing, this sense of purification that you can do in my life, I need that. I need to know that my sins have already been judged. I need to know that I'm forgiven. I want Jesus Christ at the center of my life. I want to live for him. I want to love him for the rest of my life. And I pray, God, that if there's anyone here who's ever been tempted when someone is suffering, to attribute to you those things that are not worthy of that. That God today, that, that, would, that they would have a, a fresh understanding that you're a God, that when you judge, you want people to understand what the lesson is all about. So you make it clear right up front. And if that's not happening, if the judgment is not clear, if it's not absolutely certain, this is what it's from and this is who it's from and this is what it's about and here's the way you turn, then it's obviously not something coming from you. So God, help us to never be the kind of people that would hurt others by heaping judgment on top of suffering. But instead, we would come with the love of Jesus Christ and show them that you love them, your default is always set on mercy, and you have abundant grace for whatever they're facing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you all next week.